Hello, I'm Barbara Moser and I'm a volunteer here at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and I'm standing in front of the oldest building on Cape Canaveral. This is the Cape Canaveral Lighthouse which was originally built in 1868. We had to have lighthouses here because of the shoals off of the coast here. Uh, mariners kept complaining to the United States government that it was dangerous, we needed a lighthouse. So finally in 1848, our government built a lighthouse out on the beach here at Cape Canaveral. The problem is it was too short. It was only 65 feet tall, counting its 10-foot lamp room. And it also had an extremely inadequate light system that did not shine very far out to sea. And the mariners said, by the time we see the lighthouse, we're in the shoals. We need a bigger, better lighthouse with a better light system. So in 1860, Congress voted money to build a new lighthouse. However, in 1861, the Civil War started and they were unable to build the lighthouse for two reasons, because it was going into a southern state, and secondly, because it was going to be cast at a foundry in New York State, which was a northern state. So the Cape Canaveral Lighthouse did not, be, did not get constructed until 1868. Again, it was out on the beach. However, by 1892, the ocean was eroding the beach, and they were afraid that the lighthouse was going to fall into the ocean. So they moved it to this location right here, about a mile and a half inland from where it once sat on the beach. Now, they did not pick it up and move it. Instead, they took it apart to move it. This lighthouse is a cast iron lighthouse. It was made in pieces at the foundry in New York State. It was shipped down in pieces, put together on the beach, and when they got ready to move it, they took it apart and moved it to this site and put it back together. It is what we like to jokingly call a put together by number lighthouse. Every piece has the number uh, corresponding to its adjacent piece so that they knew which pieces to put together. So within less than two years, they had moved the lighthouse to this area and relit it here at uh, its current site. The lighthouse was not painted in these colors until 1872 because at that time the Congress passed a law stating that all lighthouses in the United States would have a different color pattern. That's called uh, its day mark because in the daytime when a mariner sees the black and white uh, stripes of a certain height, these are nine feet uh, each, and they would know that that's the Cape Canaveral Lighthouse and that would be their day mark, how it's identified in the daytime. At night, mariners know where they are based on what we call the characteristic. Now the characteristic is the blinking pattern of a lighthouse. Every lighthouse has a different pattern that it blinks its light, which is uh, called um, the eclipse when it, well, it blinks and then it goes dark for an eclipse. The Cape Canaveral Lighthouse's pattern is two blinks in five seconds and then a 15 second eclipse or dark period and that occurs over and over and over all night long. So at night, mariners know where they are by the characteristic of the Fresnel lens that is blinking. During the 1840s to the 1860s, cast iron was a popular building material for buildings, not just lighthouses. We have uh, quite a few lighthouses that were built in that period of cast iron, this being one of them, but also buildings in large cities like New York and Philadelphia still show off their cast iron uh, neighborhoods. Now, cast iron houses are not all made of cast iron. Instead, they would build a brick or a stone house and then mold cast iron decorative pieces to put on the outside. It looks like lacy carving in stone, but it's not, it's cast iron. The Capitol Dome of our Capitol building in Washington, D.C. is made of cast iron. So that's how they got all that delicate pattern. Behind me, you'll see one of our windows and you'll see the rope pattern around the outside. This is the type of patterns that could be done because it's made of cast iron. Our rope pattern is looks like a rope <laughs> and it's very uh, appropriate for a nautical place like a lighthouse. To my left and behind me, you'll see a staircase. This was the only entrance to the lighthouse in the beginning. I'll get back to that in a moment, but um, it goes, it enters the lighthouse on the third level. If you think about it, if you're a lighthouse sitting out on the beach, you do not want a door opening onto the beach because hurricanes would blow the water right in. So instead, the staircases will always go up the outside and enter, this enters on the third level. 
Inside, there are spiral staircases that go from the um, 10th floor down to the lower level, which was kind of like a basement. And that was the way people had to enter the lighthouse. Above me, above the staircase, is something called a davit, D-I-V-I-T. And this was used with a uh, block and tackle to lift barrels of oil up to the third level. From there, they were lifted, again, block and tackle, all the way up to what we call the fuel room, or, which was just below where the lantern sat. And stories are always going out that lighthouse keepers carried hundreds of gallons of oil up all these stairs, like 171 stairs here, and that's just not so. They hoisted the oil up to the oil storage floor, and from there, he would fill a brass uh, pitcher with how much ever oil he needed for the day. And then that's what he carried up the rest of the way to where the lantern was. So I'm sympathetic. They worked hard. They climbed these lighthouses multiple times a day. However, they didn't carry all that heavy oil up with them. And there were storage um, cans, uh, up to 100 gallon cans, up in that oil storage room. And they um, are called butts. So I thought that was kind of funny that they're referred to as butts. They're, the way they could lift it up is that starting here on the third level, there are trap doors and they open and they could hoist it up through these trap doors. So then again, uh, they didn't have, have much trouble hoisting them up. Um, the third level door could also be used to lower furniture or something else down to the second level, which contains two rooms if they needed furniture. I will have to say at this point, our lighthouse keepers never lived in this lighthouse. All of them had similar designs. They had rooms available should lighthouse keepers live in them, and they often did. But the lighthouse keepers out here had families with them, and so they did not live in the lighthouse. We have one of those rooms furnished uh, to look kind of like a kitchen, but uh, that's just so that you would see how they could have used that room. But we know that our lighthouse keepers had houses to live in. Over here uh, behind me, or in front of me, is um, a replica of one of the keeper's cottages. When the lighthouse was originally built in 1848, there were keeper's cottages too out on the beach. However, they got destroyed by a hurricane and in 1876, they were rebuilt. When the lighthouse was moved to this spot, so were the two keeper's houses. The keeper's and the first assistant keeper's houses were moved to this spot. After they were moved here sometime uh, after that, a third cottage was built, but it didn't look like the cottages that the keeper and the assistant keeper had. Before this stopped being a lighthouse station, there were other buildings here, two storage houses, uh, some little other little things, a barn, which later served as a garage, and all of that is gone now. In 1967, the Air Force did remove all of those buildings because they were very, very old. They were uh, hard to keep up and preserve and they just did not need them and so in 1967 the Air Force removed all of the buildings from this area. However, the Keeper's Cottage has a replica of it has been rebuilt. Now I want to point out some things about the cottage. Uh, it is of a style that is known as stick style because on the front porch the um, pillars have um, decorative areas that are called, referred to as sticks. This was a style of architecture in the 1850s. And so if you look up stick style, this is a very toned down version of the stick style. It has a very steep roof, which uh, has gables on either end. And in the gables are the ends of the rafters. That's part of the decorative stick um, decoration on the stick house. So we did rebuild this um, replica and it's now used as a museum so you could visit and visit it and see more of the history of the Cape Canaveral lighthouse. Now when the I mentioned that the original lighthouse had a very very poor light system uh, which did not shine very far out to sea but when this lighthouse was installed in 1868 out on the beach this is the kind of lens it had. This is called a Fresnel lens. Because it's spelled F-R-E-S-N-E-L, Americans like to say it's a Fresnel lens. 
However, the man that invented this type of lens for lighthouses was a Frenchman, and so we have to say his name, it's Fresnel. All right, the Fresnel lens could shine up to 22 miles out to sea, and so it was certainly an improvement over the original system that was in the original lighthouse out here. Now, launches started very close to the lighthouse, about two miles from here. The bumper was launched in 1950, and then other launches uh, were within two to five miles of this lighthouse. And so um, they were afraid that all of the vibrations from the launches would break the, the prisms in the Fresnel lens. So they removed it from the lighthouse and they put it on display uh, in Daytona at the Ponce de Leon Lighthouse. They have a very nice Fresnel Lens Museum, and so our lantern is on display there. However, our lighthouse is still a working lighthouse. It has a DCB uh, 224 beacon that shines out to sea every night, and it shines the same pattern. Two blinks in, 15 sec in five seconds and an eclipse for 15 seconds, and so it is still a working lighthouse. It is main, the light is maintained by the Coast Guard, but as I said, the Air Force owns the building itself.